Abbot Trifon is founder and abbot of All Merciful Savior Monastery on Vashon Island near Seattle, Washington. He wrote the book Morning Offering and blogs and podcasts regularly under that name as well. In October of 2018, I attended the annual conference of the Brotherhood of St. Moses the Black in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, where Abbot Trifon was the keynote speaker. I really enjoyed meeting uh, Abbot Trifon and uh, having the opportunity to spend some time with him, and he kindly agreed to sit down for an interview. So without further ado, I hope you'll enjoy this episode from my interview with Abbot Trifon. The late uh, Archbishop of Verki of Jordanville, the Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville, uh, has a, uh, a saying that has become quite well known among many of us. Uh, he referred to converts as being like envelopes, that they have a tendency to come unglued. And, uh, and we've all seen people like that, new to orthodoxy. Uh, I was like that uh, when I first became orthodox. And I became a monk early on in that journey, uh, where everything that had anything to do with the externals of orthodoxy was so important. I can remember um, as a new monk some 40 years ago, of standing in the church and making the sign of the cross in a perfect way and doing the perfect bow, and then noticing whether the bishop or other priests were doing it likewise. And if they weren't, then I somehow dismissed them. Uh, I even had the uh, I even had the arrogance of judging a priest whether he had a beard or not, or whether he had an uncut beard if he had a beard, or whether he let his hair grow in the tradition of the church, and if they, if his hair was short and his beard was trimmed, I I dismissed him as not really being serious. Uh, I've also, like many, have witnessed converts standing in church, in the front of the church, uh, and doing all these almost exaggerated forms of worship uh, so that, that they will be seen by men, which Jesus talks about when he talks about what the Pharisees do, that it's not, uh, it's not from the heart, like, like um, the publican who's in the back of the temple hiding behind a pillar, beating his breast and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. But, I, but it's like this, I thank God like I, that I'm not like, uh, say that publican over there. We have to be careful as, as, as Orthodox Christians. So my advice to someone who's looking into Orthodoxy is to take a close look, not at what, your people, what other people are doing in church, but what is happening when we enter into the divine liturgy, we are not just doing some sort of a, a religious ceremony because the divine liturgy, every divine liturgy, is, a, is, a, is an entrance into a place where there's neither time nor space. We enter into the heavenly realm. I remember as a, as a new priest, I, I confessed to a friend of mine that I was keeping a journal about how many people were in liturgies for the feast days and liturgies on Sundays. And he said, why are you doing that? And I said, well, I want to be sure that, that we're, we're bringing in new people and new, new people into the church. And, and, uh, and so I'm concerned about it. You know, if we don't have five people in church or we're going to have 40 people in church and I want to see us to grow. And he said, why are you worried about numbers? Your church is packed every Sunday. And I said, no, it isn't. He says, yes, it is. He said, you know, all the icons and the frescoes on the walls of Orthodox churches are a, a reminder that, that in all of the services of the church, that when we enter into that realm of the, of the temple, we are surrounded by the heavenly hosts the angels and the archangels and the cherubim, but also those who have gone, who have fought the good fight and have gone on in victory, the saints. And he said, 
those icons aren't just depictions of people that are dead and gone. They are people who, have, who are part of the church triumphant in heaven. And when we enter into the liturgy, it's not just us here, but in the church militant. It's the church triumphant joining us. So we're the two parts of the church are together during that part. And so our churches are packed. Even if it's just the priest and the server, the church is packed. Remember that, he said. And I've never forgotten that. So I would, I would have to say that as Christians, uh, as people who are joining the church, to, to remember that uh, in the forefront of our thinking when we enter into a temple, is that we are entering into the heavenly realm. We don't have to wait to quote the old uh, uh, spiritual, um, the great by and by. We don't have to wait until the great by and by when we enter into the heavenly banquet. Every time we enter into the divine liturgy, we are entering into the heavenly banquet. We are participants in the heavenly banquet in the here and now, just as well we, we will be when we've entered through uh, the gates of paradise. And, uh, and this is really important. For those who are sort of on the fence about whether they should be orthodox or not, I would say this. Give it a chance. Uh, for some people like myself, my first experience with the Divine Liturgy was almost overwhelming. It was like, oh my gosh, I've come home. For other people, it seemed so foreign and weird. As one person said, uh, he said, uh, you know, it's sort of orthodoxy, is sort of like Catholicism on steroids. And I like that term. I mean, we are in a way. We, we, are, we don't leave anything out. We have everything. But sometimes for some people, it takes a little time to let what orthodoxy is soak in. And then once they have let it soak in, they can't turn away. Even when they have dysfunctional priests or, or uh, are scandalized by the behavior of some of their fellow parishioners, they can't leave because they've discovered the heavenly realm. And they, they don't want to ever leave that. They, all, they always want to be there. Always. And, and that's the great blessing of being patient with ourselves and letting God do the work. And, uh, and I would also add that if we're going to imitate anyone uh, and learn how to live our orthodoxy and how to worship in an orthodox church, keep your eyes out and find the kindly old woman who is greeting you with a smile and glad to see you're there. Find the old man who uh, comes in, as I've seen before, an old man that came into our cathedral in San Francisco in a walker. And it was a struggle for him. And the amazing thing was that his wife was in a wheelchair and somebody else was pushing her. And I saw the most remarkable thing. She was helped up out of her wheelchair. And she went around with, a, with two canes and venerated the icons in the church before the liturgy began. And you could tell it was a struggle for her. And she wasn't in the wheelchair. She was walking with canes with a husband that had a walker. And the love that these people had for Christ and his saints was, was easy to see on their faces. It, it, it so moved me to see that. Those are the kind of people we want to imitate. And those are the kind of people we want to pray to God for the grace that we can become like them. Not that we have to be in a wheelchair or, or walking with a walker, but that we have the heart that they have. That's what I want. I want to be like them. I want to be like my late spiritual father who, who served with such joy. It was said of Archimandrite Dimitri that, that he would actually see the angels accompany uh, the priest during the divine liturgy, uh, during the great entrance. Uh, and if you were in the altar with him, you, you would see his face become transformed and you knew it was true 
with people said of him that he could see the angels. It was true that he could see the fire that came down and consumed the gifts during during the epiclesis. Um, it, it's these are the people we want to imitate, not the people that that uh, are taking trying to live their orthodoxy light, but people that orthodoxy engulfs them and makes them saints. You know, we look at icons and it's easy to say, oh, boy, I love these saints and I pray before the icons and I kiss the icons as windows into eternity, uh, as the uh, archetype of, of, of holiness. But if we don't see ourselves as potentially being depicted on an icon in a church, then we're failing ourselves because if we're going to be in paradise with God for eternity, we have to become like them. And the beautiful thing about reading the lives of the saints is they're all different. Saint, uh, Saint uh, Tikhon of Zdansk, if I remember right, struggled with a temper. And uh, so if you have a temper problem, pray to Saint Tikhon to help you with the temper. Um, there are fools for Christ. Uh, there are uh, Saint Saint Zany of, of Petersburg was one whose um, husband was an alcoholic, and when he died, she started wearing his uniform coat. He was a military officer, and she moved into a cemetery and gave all her money away, and she lived in a cemetery. And she didn't do it because she was crazy; she did it because she offered herself up as a living sacrifice for the husband that she was afraid had missed out on paradise because of his life. And so these are, and St. Moses the Black is another example of somebody who was a, 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 a head of, led, led a, a gang that would attack people uh, on rural roads and rob them and beat them. And when he had his conversion after, uh, after confronting a saint and stealing money in the saint called out as they were going away and said, wait a minute, you forgot this. And he gave him another coin. He said, this was in my hand. Take this. You must need it more than I. And that so impressed Moses that he ended up becoming a monastic himself and became a saint. Uh, we have all these images of, of sanctity and they're all different. And that's good because we're all different. We're sort of like my favorite flower is the dahlia. And there are over 3,000 varieties of dahlia, and they're all the same. And interesting about the dahlias, unlike roses that have a beautiful scent, dahlias have no scent. And, and uh, our monastery, uh, we have lots of dahlia. And, and I remember one time we had 34 variety of dahlia. And there was one that was about this size, and it was perfectly round, and it was orange and it looked like a little Japanese lantern. And then there was another dahlia that was called a dinner plate dahlia, and it was about this big, and it was red, and you couldn't even put it in a vase with a stem because it would plop over from the weight. So you would clip it off and put it in, in a bowl of water. And they're called dinner plate dahlias. And, uh, and then all in between, all these colors. And what I love about the dahlia is it's like us. We are all different. And just like in our Orthodox churches, you look around and we don't want to let our churches be just Russians or just Greeks or just Arabs. We want our churches to be packed with, with all the dahlias of the garden. And I'm convinced that God created the dahlia in order to inspire us to have our churches filled with a multiple variety of human of humanity where we love on each other as we're worshiping be, worshiping before the throne of God. Hi again, hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with Abbot Trifon. Please subscribe below to get notified when new episodes become available, which happens every Friday. And also if you would please comment below letting me know what you thought of this video. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.